Hey, squirrel listeners. Come on. I don't think I got the book up yet. Shouldn't take long, though, hopefully. Hope y'all are doing great this morning. I couldn't believe it. Yeah, I didn't go to bed till two-ish, but of course I was falling asleep in my chair. But I didn't get up till like 9.20 this morning. Oh my gosh. And I gotta go see Sissy in a little bit. Not gotta go, but wanna go. Chapter 4. Absolutely not, said Dr. Blythe in a tone Jim understood. Jim knew there was no hope of Dad's changing his mind or that Mother would try to change it for him. It was plain to be seen that on this point, Mother and Dad were as one. Jim's hazel eyes darkened with anger and disappointment as he looked at his cruel parents glared at them, all the more glaringly that they were so maddlingly Matt, maddingly <laughs> indifferent to his glares and went on eating their supper as if nothing at all were wrong and out of joint. Of course, Aunt Mary Maria noticed his, gla his glares. Nothing ever escaped Aunt Mary Maria's mournful pale blue eyes, but she only seemed amused at them. Bertie Shakespeare Drew had been up playing with Jim all, all the afternoon. Walter, having gone down to the old house of dreams to play with Kenneth and Persis Forbes. Those are the kids of, um, what's her name? Leslie. Wow. Uh, let's see. Kenneth and Persis Ford. And Bertie Shakespeare had told, what a name had told Jim that all the Glen boys were going down to the harbor mouth that evening to see Captain Bill Taylor tattoo a snake on his cousin Joe Drew's arm. He, Bertie Shakespeare, was going, and wouldn't Jim come too? It would be such fun. Jim was at once crazy to go, and now he had been told that it was utterly out of the question. For one reason among many, said Dad, it's much too far for you to go down to the harbor mouth with those boys. They won't get back till late, and your bedtime is supposed to be at eight, son. I was sent to bed at seven every night of my life when I was a child, said Aunt Mary Maria. You must wait till you're older, Jim, before you go so far away in the evening, said Mother. You said that last week, cried Jim indignantly. I am older now. You'd think I was a baby. Bertie's going, and I'm just as old as him. There's measles around, said Aunt Mary Maria darkly. You might catch measles, James. Glenn boys are going down. Oh, I just read that. Jim hated to be called James, and she always did it. I won't catch measles, he muttered rebelliously, then catching Dad, Dad's eye instead subsided. Dad would never let anyone talk back to Aunt Mary Maria. Jim hated Aunt Mary Maria. Aunt Diana and Aunt Marilla were such ducks of ants, but an aunt like Aunt Mary Maria was something wholly new in Jim's experience. All right, he said, defiantly looking at Mother so that nobody could suppose he was talking to Aunt Mary Maria. If you don't want to love me, you don't have to, but will you like it if I just go away and shoot tigers in Africa? There are no tigers in Africa, dear, said Mother gently. Lions, then, shouted Jim. They were determined to put him in the wrong, were they? They were bound to laugh at him, were they? He'd show them. You can't say there's no lions in Africa. There's millions of lions in Africa. Africa's just full of lions. Mother and father only smiled again, much to Aunt Mary Maria's disapproval. Impatience in children should never be condoned. Meanwhile, said Susan, torn between her love for and sympathy with little Jim and her conviction that Dr. and Mrs. Doctor were perfectly right in refusing to let him go away down to the harbor mouth with that village gang to that disreputable, drunken old Captain Bill Taylor's place. 
Here's your gingerbread and whipped cream, Jim, dear. Gingerbread and whipped cream was Jim's favorite dessert, but t tonight it had no charm to soothe his stormy soul. I don't want any, he said sulkily. He got up and marched away from the table, turned at the door to hurl a final defiance. I ain't going to bed till nine o'clock anyhow, and when I'm grown, I'm never going to bed. I'm going to stay up all night every night and get tattooed all over. I'm just going to be as bad as bad can be, you'll see. I'm not would be so much better than ain't, dear, said Mother. Could nothing make them feel? I suppose nobody wants my opinion, Annie, but if I talk to my parents like that, Uh, when I was a child, I would have been whipped within an inch of my life, said Aunt Mary Maria. I think it's a great pity. The birch rod has been so neglected now in some homes. Little Jim is not to blame, snapped Susan, seeing that Dr. and Mrs. Dr. were not going to say anything. But if Mary Maria, but if Mary Maria Blythe was going to get away with that, she, Susan, would know the reason why. Bertie Shakespeare Drew put him up to it, filling him up with what fun it would be to see Joe Drew tattooed. He was there all the afternoon and sneaked into the kitchen and took the best aluminum saucepan to use as a helmet. Said they were playing soldiers. Then they made boats out of shingles and got soaked to the bone, sailing them in the, ho in the hollow brook. And after that, they went hopping about the yard about for a solid hour making the weirdest noises pretending they were frogs frogs no wonder little jim is tired out and not himself he's the best behaved child that that ever lived when he's not worn to a frazzle and that you may tie to aunt mary maria said nothing aggravatingly she never talked to susan baker at meal times thus expressing her disapproval over susan being allowed to sit with the family at all. Anne and Susan had thrashed that out before Aunt Mary Maria had come. Susan, who knew her place, never sat or expected to sit with the family when there was company at Ingleside. But Aunt Mary Maria isn't company, said Anne. She's just one of the family, and so are you, Susan. In the end, Susan gave in, not without a secret satisfaction that Mary Maria Blythe would see that she was no common hired girl. Susan had never met Aunt Mary Maria, but a niece of Susan's, the daughter of her sister Matilda, had worked for her. And Charlottetown had told Susan all about her. I'm not going to pretend to you, Susan, that I'm overjoyed at the prospect of a visit from Aunt Mary Maria, especially just now, said Anne, frankly. But she has written Gilbert asking, asking if she may come for a few weeks, and you know how the doctor is about such things, and he has such a perfect right to be, said Susan staunchly. What is a man to do? But stand by his own flesh and blood but as for a few weeks well mrs doctor dear i do not want to look on the dark side of things but my sister matilda's sister-in-law came to visit her for a few weeks and stayed for 20 years oh my law i don't think we need dread anything like that susan smiled and aunt mary marie has a very nice home of her own in charlotteville but she is finding it very big and lonely. Her mother died two years ago, you know. She was 85, and Aunt Mary Maria was very good to her and misses her very much. Let's make her visit as pleasant as we can, Susan. I'll do what in me lies, Mrs. Dr. Dear. Of course, we must put another board in the table, but after all is said and done, it's better to be lengthening the table than shortening it down. We mustn't have flowers on the table, Susan, because I understand they give her asthma, and Pepper makes her sneeze, so we'd better not have it. She's subject to frequent bad headaches, too, so we must really try not to be noisy. Oh, gosh. Good grief. Well, I've never noticed you and the doctor making much noise, and if 
I, and if I want to yell, I can go to the middle of the maple bush. But if our poor children have to keep quiet all the time because of Mary Maria Blythe's headaches, you will excuse me for saying I think it's going to be a, going a little too far, Mrs. Dr. Dear. It's just for a few weeks, Susan. Let us hope so. Oh, well, Mrs. Dr. Dear, we just have to take the lean streaks with the fat in this world was Susan's final word. So Aunt Mary Maria came, demanding immediately upon her arrival if they had had the chimneys cleaned recently. She had, it appeared, a great dread of fires. And I've always said that the chimneys of this house aren't nearly tall enough. I hope my bed has been well aired, and damp bed linen is terrible. One took possession of the Ingleside guest room, and incidentally all the other rooms in the house except Susan's. Nobody held her arrival with frantic delight. Jim, after one look at her, slipped out to the kitchen and, and whispered to Susan, Can we laugh while she's here, Susan? Walter's eyes brimmed with tears at the sight of her, and he had to be hustled out of the room the twins did not wait to be hustled but ran out of their ran of their own accord even the shrimp susan averred went and had a fit in the backyard only surely shook only surely stood his ground gazing fearlessly at her out of his br round brown eyes from the safe anchorage of susan's lap and arm Aunt Mary Maria thought the Ingleside children had very bad manners. Bad, but what could you expect when they had a mother who wrote for the papers and a father who thought they were, they were perfection just because they were his kids and a hired girl like Susan Baker who never knew, never knew her place. But she, Mary Maria Blythe, would do her best for poor cousin John's grandchildren as long as she was at Ingleside. Your grace is much too short, Gilbert, she said disapprovingly at her first meal. Would you like me to say grace for you while I'm here? It will be a better example to your family. Much to Susan's horror, Gilbert said he would, and Aunt Mary Maria said grace at supper, more like a prayer than grace, Susan sniffed over her dishes. Susan privately agreed <clears throat> with her niece's description of Mary Maria Blythe. She always seemed to be smelling a bad smell, Aunt Susan, not an unpleasant odor, just a bad smell. Gladys had a way of putting things, Susan reflected, and yet to anyone less prejudiced than Susan, Miss Mary Maria Blythe was not ill-looking for a lady of 35. Oh gosh, I thought she was a lot older. Wait a minute, 55. Um, she had what she believed were aristocratic features framed by always sleek, gray crimps which seemed to insult daily susan's spiky little knob of gray hair she dressed very nicely wore long jet earrings in her ears and her fashionably high bone neck collars on her lean throat at least we do not need to be ashamed of her appearance reflected susan but what Aunt Mary Maria would have thought if she would have known Susan was consoling herself on such grounds must be left to the imagination. <laughs> Poor then, they have to put up with that lady for weeks. Oh my goodness. So tomorrow we'll be at chapter 5. Hope you enjoyed chapter 4 today. And hope you have a lovely crafty, delightful, Christmassy, Tuesday, December 15th. Love ya. Be sweet. Don't be ugly. No live today, but I'll see you around in somebody's chat. But I will be going over to Miss Teresa Patton's in about noontime today. Okay, love you bunches. See ya.